Yo, what is good, Dev guys? Welcome back. In this video, I want to go over this document shared by a gentleman named Michael Chapman. It goes over briefly uh, what the game playability system is and the and things that are included in the game playability system. So let's jump right into it. So Gas is a common plugin shared by Paragon and Fortnite. It handles gameplay mechanics, plus their replication and prediction. This allows the engineers at Epic to handle the network prediction and replication in C++, and it allows the game designer, that's us, to work in blueprint and tweak mechanics easily. It's generic enough to support anything that the design team comes up with, and it's optimized to reduce network load. So there's a lot of uh, resources out there, and there's even more than listed here now. This is a pretty old document, but it still gets the point across. There's a gas documentation. There's gas shooter. Uh, I'll leave links to those somewhere where you can get them easily. But yeah, there is a, a few. I'll leave a link to this uh, PowerPoint as well so that you guys could click on these links and travel to these GitHub repos. Uh, but yeah, definitely check out the resources. They show you a little bit of how to set things up and where to use different things about the game playability system. So th there's different concepts included inside of gas. There's the ability system component, there's attribute sets, there's gameplay tags, which aren't really gas oriented, uh, but they are used a lot in gas. You can actually use gameplay tags without gas. There's gameplay effects, gameplay cues, there's gameplay abilities. That's where all of the actual action happens inside of the gameplay abilities. These gameplay tasks, we'll talk more about those, um, and gameplay events. So starting with the ability system component, this is the central point for coordinating everything. And it's attached to an actor that must implement this interface here, this I ability system interface. So basically you create it how you create any other component. And um, whenever you possess it, you give it this uh, info here that it basically initializes the ability system component. Like it says here, it's relatively, relatively lightweight and you can attach to anything that should receive effects or activate abilities. So this could be on an actor that takes damage or it could be on an actor that gives damage, basically. Uh, the ability system also has these attribute sets. These store replicated floats wrapped inside of a struct. This F gameplay attribute data is a struct that holds a lot of information that's used and passed around throughout the gameplay ability system. So here there's an example of health and there's also this on rep health. This is how we as the client will know that our health has been changed and we'll, we'll write some of this code and I'll explain it more in depth when we get into the actual IDE and start coding things up. And here you can, you know, account for temporary changes without losing the base. You can get the numeric value or get the numeric value base. You can also set a numeric value as well. So there's um, these events here that happen, and these are called whenever an attribute changes, the pre-attribute change gets called, the uh, base change gets called, the pre-attribute change gets called, the post-gameplay effect execute gets called after a gameplay effect is executed on you, and the pre-gameplay uh, effect execute gets called right before the uh, gameplay effect gets executed on you. So there's a lot of code that we can write inside of these events here since you can kind of inject different code when you want different things to happen based on different gameplay effects. Say I take damage and I want the player's UI to update and whenever I take damage uh, a gameplay effect will execute. So in the post gameplay effect I can check and see if my damage attribute or my health attribute was changed and I could do something based off of that. So there's these gameplay tags, which I told you that don't even need to be really used only with gas. You can use these anywhere in your project. Uh, so it says here, if attributes are the float part of describing the game state, tags are the bool part. Can be applied locally and have the state managed manually. So here we can add uh, minimal replication gameplay tags. And, and by default, gameplay tags aren't replicated, like loose gameplay tags aren't replicated, um, but you can send whatever gameplay tag replicated uh, of your choice. And it says more commonly apply via effects and replicate it can be applied multiple times in stack. Uh, there's a there's a nice, nice resource in the Lyra starter game where they actually use tags to track ammo for the weapons, which is pretty cool. 
and it, it triggers events on both clients and server. And here we got this F on gameplay effect tag count change. This is a callback. So you can register to these events whenever a tag changes. So say there's a tag added to you that slows you and you want to display like a little pop up on the screen that lets the player know that they're slowed. So whenever that tag is active or on the character's ability system component, you can uh, uh, bind to this callback here and go ahead and run some code whenever that callback is is actually uh, uh, initiated. Gameplay effects, man. These are one of the biggest workhorses in the gameplay ability system. It can modify attributes, can add or remove tags. It can be instant, have a duration, or be infinite. We'll get more in depth on what and when and where to use these three different types. These duration policies are what they call. Uh, this can trigger a gameplay queue. It can have tags on itself. It can be blocked by tags like the, uh, this is basically how you apply slows, how you apply damage, how you apply damage over time. If someone's poisoned and so on and so forth, um, let's keep on moving. So here we got this this note here, this apply gameplay effect to target this apply gameplay effect to owner. Uh, you use these based on where you're calling them from. Uh, here it says the target is a gameplay ability, meaning that this is. Uh, co uh, coded into the gameplay ability itself. You can al also call these from the gameplay ability system component and, and have someone uh, apply an effect to themselves based on an overlap or something like that. And we'll, we'll try to touch as many things as possible with the gas system so that you guys can kind of, you know, wrap your heads around and get a lot of experience with different things you can do inside of gas. Here we have this uh, create gameplay effect spec from class. That's a that's a um, a node as well. And you can add or remove tags it's set by caller magnitude. This is a very important, very important thing right here um, for specifically for damage. Uh, you can pass a value through and then that will be your damage. You can add an effect context and an effect spec to self to target. The effect spec is basically what gets created once you um, pass the gameplay effect through here. So here we have these gameplay cues. These are cosmetic effects. These are like the VFX that happen when you're hit or when you're slowed or when someone, you know, calls down an airstrike. This could be the effect that is fired whenever that happens. Um, so these are driven by a tag namespace gameplay cue. You cannot use any other tag to drive gameplay cues if it doesn't have gameplay cue in front of it. It can be triggered by gameplay effects as we saw on the last slide. It can be executed by a predicting client in an ability and then replicated out, meaning that I could call the gameplay cue on my client and then locally predict that to where the server will say, okay, let me call this as well so everyone else could see it. It's kind of like a multicast. And it can be executed locally and not replicated at all for just client sided uh, events and things like that. And, and we'll be using this for like number pop ups and damage pop ups and stuff like that. Here's some uh, functions that are you can override here where you put your game specific logic inside. And we'll touch more on that when we get inside of a gameplay queue. Whoops, go back here. So the gameplay abilities, this is pretty much the workhorse of the system here. So I'm going to read this out here. Is it provide a network predictive way? And it says optionally because you can make a completely non-network game with gameplay abilities and everything will just work. Uh, but we're going to be working in a multiplayer environment. So we're going to focus on network predicted. And, and it says a network predictive way of interacting with all of these elements, the elements being the gameplay ability systems, attribute sets, the effects, the gameplay cues. That's what it means by all of these elements. It has uh, lots of tag options. You can cancel other abilities, block other abilities from activating, require specific tags to activate this ability. You can block this ability from activating based on the tag. You can apply a tag to the owner when activated. And that is how we're going to track what actual abilities are being activated uh, by the tag that's given to the owner whenever they do activate the ability. This instancing policy here, this per actor, per execution, and non-instance, uh, that's more of an optimization thing. Per actor means that 
it, there will be one instance of this ability per actor. Per execution is basically saying there's one instance of this ability per execution. So you can see, you know, most of the time you want to use per actor. Per execution, I think it's like overkill. Non-instance means that there will be one instance of this globally. So I'm not sure where that's used. I haven't actually used non-instance before, but maybe there's like a global ability that you want to put on the gameplay uh, or on the game mode or something like that. Uh, so net execution policy, you got a local predicted, local only, server initiated and server only. These, these are pretty straightforward. Local predicted means I'll run it on the client first and then the server will run it afterwards. Or they kind of, it's kind of like asynchronously, they both run it. Um, but the local predicted means the client will run it whenever the ability is initiated. That way there's no uh, felt lag whenever something happens. Local is just something that happens only on the client. Server initiated is something that can only, uh, an ability that can only be initiated by the server, meaning that the server has to call the activate ability in order for the ability to activate. Server only means that it only happens on the server. And it also has options to in, input a cooldown effect class and a cost effect class. And, and think about how abilities have cooldowns in a game like Apex. Whenever you use your ultimate, it goes on a cooldown. Or uh, cost is more of like if you have like something like mana or stamina, that's kind of like the cost. Okay, so more about gameplay abilities. Most player abilities will be local predicted. This will have the ability to grab and run on both the client and the server. Often there will be a wait target data node at the beginning. This allows a player to visualize aiming. This is something what that will do a lot. We'll wait for the target data on the server. And once the client sends the target data up to the server, then we'll execute logic. The cooldown and the cost will be applied when the commit ability is used. So whenever you actually want to start the cooldown, that's when you'll call commit ability. All paths must lead to end ability or the ability won't be able to trigger more than once and it'll continue running and it could cause possible data leaks inside of your gameplay. So it says all paths must lend, lead to an end ability or you gameplay ability instance will not be cleaned up, meaning that it won't be removed from memory. More on gameplay abilities. Here is a simple ability that applies an effect to the caster. And pretty much all your gameplay abilities will look like this. You'll have the activate ability. There's also another event where you can activate an ability based on a event tag. Uh, we'll get into, we'll probably get into that. We'll see. Um, so here that he activates the ability, we commit the ability to initiate the cooldown and uh, charge the costs. And if that goes through, meaning that we're not trying to activate this ability while we're on a cooldown or we don't have enough of the cost. We don't have enough mana or stamina to use the ability. It'll just end the ability. But if everything is good, we'll apply this gameplay effect to owner and the self is basically the owner of this ability. And here it says async charge. And this is some gameplay effect that probably has a duration that loops. And then we'll end the ability. And that's pretty much the workflow of most abilities. Once you get to actually make an ability, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty, you know, what you're used to as a designer. Like, I want to do A, B, C in this order. And you just do that. Here's a uh, another ability that spawns a projectile. We won't actually be uh, using this node here. Um, we'll be using our own version of this task here. But... Um, Basically, we go in here, we commit the ability. Same thing if we have, if we are not on cooldown, if we have the uh, uh, required cost, we go ahead and cast it upon, set it as the inner instigator, and then we go ahead and spawn a fireball. And then here we go, we end the ability depending on whether we uh, successfully spawned it or didn't spawn it. You see here we have a, a output pin for the spawn actor if we want to do something particular on that actor, we have that option. Gameplay tasks, man, this the, this list gets deep. You can write your own gameplay tasks for your gameplay specific needs. We will do a couple as well. Uh, and they also have a, a very large library of already uh, like uh, basically written gameplay tasks that you can use as a frame of reference when you want to write your own gameplay task. That is, that's similar to another gameplay task, but not exactly similar. 
So there is a flexible task running framework. It can be used separately from gameplay abilities, meaning that you can use these tasks inside of your regular blueprints. Um, the, the gas component inherits from the task management component, and that's what allows it to, to kind of manage these tasks. We have a B simulated task, B ticking task, and the ability tasks add some convenience pieces on top of gameplay tasks. We'll talk more about ability tasks when we get there. And it's designer focused. Like I said, you can do things specific to how your game needs to run. There's a lot in here, man. We'll be using this repeat action, this wait confirm, wait delay. We'll be using all that stuff. Okay, so gameplay events, they trigger things from other things. <laughs> I like that. It's associated with a tag and a U object payload. You can trigger abilities or you can wait for an event. Uh, we'll be using this wait gameplay event node here uh, a lot here because there's a lot of things that will happen in animations and we'll send through a gameplay tag to, to kind of say here, this is where we want to spawn the projectile. This is the part in the animation where we want to spawn the projectile. We'll send a, a tag, we'll wait on that tag. And whenever that tag is received, we'll run our logic here. You can make this gameplay event data struct here. You can pass in an instigator, target, optional objects, contact. You, you can basically give this event information so that you can do things specific based off of that information. Um, here's just him shouting out who helped him put this thing together. Um, so that's pretty much the end of this slide. And uh, if you guys are ready, I'll see you in the next video. Peace.